Uh, so I've had a little bit of nervousness about uh, talking to you guys because <clears throat> even though I do men's groups and I've actually led groups, I I've been doing a little number on myself, first time teacher thing, but oh, I'm too <clears throat> academic and I do this, I'm just a second. I'm not a leader, I'm just, I'm just a guy. So it's, I, I, it's the, only, it's the only way that I can be here is to be myself fully, or else I just get too crazy. So uh, <clears throat> I had to say that. And I think part of um, why I have to go through that whenever I'm standing before a group, which I kind of do a different version of that, whenever it has to do with my own work. And my own work has to do with power, with my power, with uh, male power. Because um, the only models for male power that I've ever seen it, mostly in my life have been bad ones, like my dad. And so I spent a lot of my time in my life being twisted up about the issue of power. Uh, I have some, and I would use it, and then I'd exploit it, and then I'd try and act like I didn't have it, and then I'd divest of it, and then I'd get all fucked up that way, and then I'd go back around again. So this book, <clears throat> sitting here and, and writing for four years about my life and my thoughts was a big um, opening up my throat and letting my insides come outside, which were, was very, it was a continual process of cutting up against an edge of my own, you know, wanting to hide. And uh, coming up here and doing this is more, more of that. I want to start with a poem that Robert indirectly made me aware of through an um, uh, edited uh, compilation of poems. This is um, D.H. Lawrence. Some of you probably know this poem. <clears throat> I am not a mechanism, an assembly of various sections. And it is not because the mechanism is working wrongly that I am ill. I am ill because of wounds to the soul, to the deep emotional self. And the wounds to the soul take a long, long time. Only time can help, and patience, and a certain difficult <coughs> repentance. Now, many of you may know this. Repentance and sin were originally archery terms. Did you know that? They were archery terms. And um, sin meant to miss the mark, and repentance meant to return to it. Meant what? Return. Return to it. The wounds to the soul take a long, long time. Only time can help and patience and a certain difficult repentance. Long, difficult repentance. Realization of life's mistake and the freeing oneself from the endless repetition of the mistake which mankind at large has chosen to sanctify. So I'm thinking, <clears throat> why are we here? We're here for sweetening. Hmm? The sweetness inside ourselves and the sweetness with each other. <clears throat> so, I, I don't feel comfortable sort of um, pretending that I'm a leader or that I have anything profound to say about where to from here. Uh, let me just tell you about what I do. I sit in an office in Boston. I've been sitting there, uh, that office and others, for about 20 years. And I deal with guys. And I deal with guys, I do some groups, but I deal with guys primarily in the context of their relationships, because I'm a family therapist. So I deal with guys who are mostly brought in by women, you know? I tell my students, if I had a nickel for every guy who brought in his wife saying she needs to be more intimate, I could not retire. <laughs> 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 so I deal with guys often who are brought 
more lately, as man's consciousness has risen, I deal with guys who elect to come. And um, I do do groups, and I do love the energy of guys being with guys. And also, I do a lot of frontline work around helping men grow at the edge of their actual day-to-day -day relationships with the people that they live with, including women. And what I'd like to do at a broader level is, um, along with the wonderful sweetness and connection that's happening between men, think about how to bring the aliveness and spirituality and sweetness out into our relationships with the people that we live with, which frankly I think is harder to do, it is for me. There's a lot of wounding <clears throat> in our relationships to mothers as well as fathers, and there's a lot, a lot of pain and mistrust and betrayal in our relationships with women. So I'm going to talk about the big picture, but I thought I might um, ground it in my own experience um, and uh, share some of that. Okay. We've talked a lot about the um, wound between men and their fathers, but I wanted to uh, balance that in our talk today and, and uh, speak about both that and also the wound between men and our mothers. This is my particular version. <clears throat> my father was a brute, a force of nature, as mindless and in a way as predictable as some large beast. One had the misfortune of disturbing. But the injury I felt from my mother went deeper. It was more like a puncture than a gash. Get that? More like a puncture than a gash. Like many children from chaotic homes, even though my father was the flagrant ab abuser, my most unresolved feelings were reserved for the one who refused to protect me. While I know intellectually that my feelings toward her might be unfair, they nevertheless remain less forgiving than those toward my dad. My father lashed out at us on impulse, thoughtlessly, but I could watch my mother decide to abandon us. I could feel her waver for an instant between husband and child and then retreat from all of us. I could see it in her eyes. In preparation for the ritual beatings, mother would be brought into the room to watch. They had learned somewhere that it was important to present a unified front to the children. As I was strapped, I would plead with my mother, at first with words, and later as I grew older with just my eyes. I would beg her to help me, to get him off me. I would watch as the light of consciousness left her staring straight at me, brazenly, as if in a dare, I could see my mother vacate. It was an oddly intimate moment, almost obscene, as if she were showing me some wanton part of herself I really had no business glimpsing. Where did she go? That question plagued me when she decided to abandon me to him, when the light in her eyes went out like that, where did she go? To some chill territory I sensed to which it would not be in my interest to follow. Where did she go? She dissociated, Robert. She just spaced out because the and I, the demands on her were. Um, it's like uh, in family therapy, Gregory Bateson's idea of a double bind. You know that one. <clears throat> this guy came up with an idea of schizophrenia. If you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. 
You can't process it and you can't leave. The only thing you can do is skiz out. And that's what, that's what uh, so many mothers do in these circumstances. And then we carry the wound of their abandonment. You know, deep, deep. And I have to say, in terms of breaking down some of these stereotypes and boundaries, I'm working with a woman named Carol Gilligan, who's a well-known woman writer in Boston. We're co-directing a project together. And what we've decided is that the two of us as a couple can say things that neither of us alone can say without getting stoned, <laughs> stoned to death. <laughs> and one of the things we want to talk about is the abandonment of women, the abandonment of mothers. There's a lot of talk about, and it's been beautiful work, uh, about the overbearingness of mothers. But as some of you know from the book, I also talk about the ways that mothers retreat from their sons. It's both. So <clears throat> that brings me to the work. So you know, here's what I am. I'm the guy in the trenches. I'm like a medic in the gender wars. That's what I do. I sit up there in Boston, and I deal all day long with various forms of disaster and casualties. And um, I really felt that we didn't have a clear enough understanding of what was going on. Um, <clears throat> Because I was the son of an abusive father, and he was the son of an abusive father, I got very involved with the issue of violence. And not just physical violence. Physical violence is the least of it. I got really involved with the issue of psychological violence. And not just the violence <clears throat> that is done to us, but also the violence that we do. Now, whether it's right or wrong, um, there's a split in the culture right now about the way people think about men. And the, the image of where the men's movement is right now is that it deals with men's wounds, but it doesn't take up uh, the issue of men's irresponsible and violent and offensive behavior. I think that's wrong to a degree, but that's the image. The image of the women's movement and the feminists is that they're very tied into the ways in which men can behave badly. But as we all know, they don't hold men particularly lovingly. And so when I was faced with John in my office, <clears throat> the, what I said for myself was to figure out some way to confront terrible destructive behavior and at the same time hold him in love. That was my goal. And that's how I keyed into this idea of depression. It really came from that. So <clears throat> when I first wrote this book, the understanding was that depression was mostly a woman's disease, that men don't get depressed. That two to four women get depressed over every one man, and I uh, argue against that. And what I say is that the reason, I think that there's, uh, I think most every man in this culture has some degree of depression, and a great, great many men have a serious degree of depression. And the reason why it's hidden is twofold. The first is that it's shameful for a man to be vulnerable and to admit that he's in pain. And the second is that we men handle pain differently than women do. <clears throat> and there's actually empirical studies that say that women in this culture tend to internalize pain. They feel bad. They know they feel bad. They talk about it. They reach out to their girlfriends. And that men in this culture tend to externalize pain. We have about a millisecond's worth of tolerance for pain, and then we move into action. And for about 40 years, psychologists and researchers were saying, well, that's why men don't get, don't get depressed, because this protects them from getting depressed. And what I said in the book is that our movement into action protects us from feeling depressed, but it doesn't protect us from being depressed. And this depression or pain that we don't feel, but that we live out, which is what I call covert depression, tends to be inflicted on others. So I say, by and large, depressed women have pain and depressed men have troubles. They're not in pain, the people around them are in pain. 
So uh, <clears throat> I'm looking at how that gets set up. You know, it's, um, here's the distinction. I, I got one of my old teachers said, <clears throat> some guys, they walk into an elevator, they get claustrophobic and they get sick. And there are other guys walk in an elevator, they light up a big cigar and you get sick. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, how, how, do you, how, as a therapist, do I handle that kind of guy? Or how, as a human being, do I handle that kind of behavior in myself that's so hard to look at, even see when you're doing it? So what, what I began to look, uh, key into is the issue of shame. Now, shame is the natural legacy of every American male. Uh, somebody said, there's only one unblushing man in America. He's about six foot two, wasp, clear complexion, well muscled, good at school, has a BMW, blah, 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 blah. Everybody else feels like shit about themselves. <laughs> so there's a, lot, there's a lot of shame, and I'll talk about where that comes from. <clears throat> But then this, um, there's a two-step process. The second part of the process is what you do with the shame. So as I thought about violence in men, <clears throat> these lines came to me from T.S. Eliot. Remember us, if at all, not as lost, violent souls, but simply as the hollow men, the stuffed men. And I began to think about this process as a two-step process of hollowing and stuffing. First boys are hollowed and then they're stuffed. And the way that we handle our shame a lot as men <clears throat> is by getting rid of it. And the best way that I know of to get rid of shame anybody know, want to guess what you do? What's the quickest way to get, where, where do you go Huh? You can dump it on others. Yeah. The, the quickest way to get rid of feeling one down is to go one up. And the quickest way to deal with shame is to move up into grandiosity. Better than. Expansive. So one day I was taking a shower and it came to me that there is a common English word uh, that describes a sudden shift from shame and constriction into grandiosity and openness. Do you know what that word is? It's called intoxication. Yeah. So when I began to think, put that together, it occurred to me that a lot of the difficulties that we men get ourselves into has to do with this. It has to do with, uh, I, I, when I teach it, I, I tell people to think of like an M&M &M. There's a soft, gooey center, and then there's a hard shell. And that soft, gooey center, center is about shame, which you don't get to see much, except maybe in real intimate, real meetings like this. A hard shell is what most people get to see. A hard shell shows up as drinking, drugging, womanizing, lashing out, violence, abuse. So, um, so in my work with men, I began to do a two-step process because I think the most therapy is uh, far too passive with men. And the first step of the process is to really take an inventory of whatever those defenses were. Isolating, lashing out, drugging, spending hours by the TV set, whatever it is, and stopping it cold. Hey, look. This has to stop. And then the second step of the process is reaching into the center and saying, now let's get to the pain. And that's what Robert was talking about, about making a covert depression overt. All you have to do really to make a covert depression overt is stop the acting out and then sit there with some degree of patience and love and the man's wounds will come streaming up to the surface because we're hungry to have them dealt with. Now, what are those wounds? <clears throat> um, 
there are a lot of levels to talk about the the wounds, some of which I feel totally inadequate to try and deal with, spiritual level, historical level. But um, at the psychological level, I'm really clear. See, for about 30 years, uh, women and feminists have been talking about how girls are deformed. You must know that. The loss of girls' voice and reviving Ophelia and how girls lose their self-esteem in adolescence and how they shut up and accommodate and all that's true. And this book is about the reciprocal story for boys. Now, I was really thinking last night about this question, this wonderful question, what happens to us in the absence of healthy initiation? And <clears throat> What I came to last night as I was turning this question over is that I think that what's happened to us in the absence of unhealthy initiation is a very degraded form of masculinity, a very degraded form about that transition. And I really focus on that in the book. The way that we, look, what I feel really strongly here this weekend being with you all is the richness of what it means to be a man, the sweetness of what it means to be a man. You know, I look at Robert Bly, who's talking about, what did he say yesterday? Becoming a hen. <laughs> 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 Satisfied. <laughs> huh? I, I, that's a long way from Newsweek photos of guys with war paint, you know? It's feminine. And um, I think that with healthy initiation and a healthy community that becoming fully a man means that, becoming fully a man. Uh, I was in, uh, I really had a life-changing experience in, uh, in Africa. I hope I don't bore people by keep referring to it, but it was amazing. I, I had friends who took me to a Maasai village. Robert had been there, it turns out, another synchronicity. And because of my work with men, <clears throat> my friends who knew these people very, very well, 20 years, uh, arranged for me to meet with the male elders, and we talked. We had a, a group not all that dissimilar to this. So I asked them, I said, hey, listen, in America, there's this big debate. And some people think that being a good Marani, good warrior, is to be strong and tough and firm. And some people are saying that to be a good Marani <clears throat> is to be sensitive and gentle and respectful. Which is it? This goes around or a big thing. Finally, a guy stands up and he says to me, I don't want to talk to you about what it takes to be a good Marani. I want to talk to you about what it takes to be a great Marani. OK. Now, to be a great Marani, when the moment calls for fierceness, nobody fucks with you. And when the moment calls for tenderness, you are not tender. You are very, very tender. So you see. And a great Marani knows which is which. That's right. Right. Now that's full manhood. And what I'm writing about is that that's exactly what we have been deprived of. And I feel really emotionally, very strongly, that that's what we're recovering in this poetry. We're recovering the right to relax. Because in the absence of the security of our manhood and the security of our membership, what has come to take its place is a really destructive myth. Here's the myth. <clears throat> The myth is that in order for boys to achieve a stable sense of masculine identity, they must separate from their mothers, identify with their fathers, and it is really a perilous process. And if you don't, if you don't have strong fathers to identify with, if you don't have a stable sense of masculinity, if you're insecure in any way, shape, or form, then you can turn out to be a gang member, a junkie, a homosexual, a druggie. They're all sort of equated. This has been sort of the going theory in sociology and psychology for 40, 50 years. 
And <clears throat> it's not that simple. So what I began to do in my work was to say, hey, listen, this idea that women are relational and that men are rocks is stupid. And that boys and men are just as relational, just as dependent, just as emotional, just as needy uh, as women are. These aren't women's needs, these are human needs. And that this, this, uh, this frightful thing about squeezing our boys into, squeezing ourselves into this little straitjacket called manhood is violent. That's what I began to work with, is violent. The way that we turn boys into men in this culture, and I'm sure every single one of us has stories, is through violence. It's through disconnection. We sever boys from their mothers because we don't want them to be sissies. We sever boys from their hearts because we don't want them to be soft. We sever boys from too much vulnerability. We sever boys from too much connection to others. We push them into this independence. And if I had longer, I could talk, I could read to you from you know, really violent examples to that all the way up to very subtle everyday examples of how we do that and the pain of that. And if a boy resists that, <clears throat> the force and the violence that's leveled against him is, I think, infinitely greater, not to get into comparisons, but infinitely greater than if a girl steps out of a role. I mean, it's really ferocious. So, if I can, uh, I'll tell you, uh, many of you know that, uh, you know the, the movie the, uh, Dead Poet Society? Can I see hands? Yeah, it's, okay, so that's a good reference. I like to use this because everybody, everybody knows it. Well, that movie was about this. That movie was about the violence of enforced masculinity. I call it perpetrating masculinity. And if you remember, just think about it. It's really beautiful, actually. So Robin Williams comes in, and what he brings into this very um, overly hierarchical, not healthfully hierarchical, right, but sort of totalitarian hierarchical realm, is this, poetry, community. The Dead Poet Society is a little adolescent men's group. They have, they go off, they have a cave, they have rituals, they have poetry, they have art, they have each other. And this is very, very threatening to everybody. Very threatening. And so the, the sort of lead boy discovers himself as an actor, if you remember the movie. And um, <clears throat> this drives his father crazy. And his father comes in and says, look, you can't act in that play. You have to do the straight and narrow. And the boy decides to disobey him because he's made a commitment to his fellows. So here's, here's, the, here's the, the conflict. On the one hand, he has this rigid vision. Do your work. That's what the, do your work. Like what that guy was saying. You've got to do your work. Fuck, fuck love. Do your work. And then he has his commitment to his own heart and he has this commitment to his peers, connection inside and out. And he chooses connection. And the father comes in like Yahweh on a bad day, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, <clears throat> you know that aspect of fathers? <laughs> I'll give you something to cry about. And he does, it's interesting what he does, he retaliates with disconnection. He says, I'm going to pull you away from the teacher that you love, your mentor, your teacher. I'm going to pull you away from the peers, from the other young men that you love. I'm going to pull you away from your art. I'm going to send you to military academy, and they're really going to kick ass with you. And the boy does not go gently into his father's night. The boy commits suicide. Now, for those of you who remember, do you remember what he was wearing when he committed suicide? You have to really get the... He, he, the, the, he, he played, he was dressed in total gender protest in the costume of the character he was playing, Puck the Fairy. Fuck you. Huh? So I talk about, 
because you know, I've gotten sensitized to this issue. In, in the book I write about an incident that um, I had a little three-year-old Alexander, sweet, wonderful little boy. He's a little older now, he's still sweet. But, and he used to like to dress up in all kinds of things, you know, fairies and Draculas and shit like that. But his, his favorite thing was fairy. And um, now I'm, I'm supposed to be a gender specialist. I have all these enlightened people, in my, right? People were calling me to worry with me about Alexander's gender confusion. Because yeah. <laughs> he liked to wear dress. He really did. Like, I mean, it was a little hairy. I mean, he did like those dresses, I have to say. But, <laughs> but you know, nobody called me up to say, do you think he'll be confused that he's really Dracula? <laughs> 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 so here's what happened. I want you to get this. I want you to get the feeling of this. So one day, Alexander's big brother, Justin, who's seven, you know, was there with his other boys. And, uh, and he sees these guys, and he gets all excited. And he runs upstairs, because he's excited. And he puts on his fairy paraphernalia and his tiara and <laughs> his magic wand, you know? And he comes rushing downstairs and he goes kind of like this. And these boys just look up from their work and they just like, look at him. Dig that. Wait a minute. Look at him. Now these are nice, liberal boys, right? And they didn't ridicule him. They just look at him. And I'll tell you, that moment was white hot. It was white hot. I, my face. And he like just looked at them, looked at him. He ran upstairs, took off this shit, put on long pants, put on a shirt, went downstairs and said, let's make swords. That's what he said. That's Justin? That's Alexander, the little that one. That was Alexander? Yeah, the little one. Let's make swords, which is what they did. How old are you now? He was three. <laughs> three. And I want to tell you, he has never worn that dress again. Ever. And can you feel the lash? Yeah. That's a wound. That's a wound. So what, what has happened in this culture is that in the absence of healthy forms of transitioning boys to become men, we have all gotten fucking paranoid. And masculinity has become defined as not being feminine. Somebody called it a negative identity. What are you as a man? I'm not a girl. A, I'm not a girl. Well, there's a number of problems. First of all, you can never be secure in a negative identity. Because at any moment, you might be a girl. <laughs> Sneak up on you. <laughs> but you know that, right? It's called homophobia. You know? I don't want to touch this guy's hand for too long because I might wake up tomorrow and be in drag. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows what's going to come out? And again, I loved being with the Messiah. I know, you, I know you saw this too, but I was walking with my friend, this young Messiah man. And uh, when, when the Messiah men walk together... Well, would you stand up for a second? When the Messiah, Messiah men walk together, here, they walk like this. Just they don't have pins. No. They don't have pins. <laughs> oh, they might. They walk like this. Or they stand like this. And I was walking with this guy, and he, uh, he just took my hand. And we were walking together, holding hands. And I thought, oh, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Get a load of this back in Boston. <laughs> But you know, it, it's kind of a cliche, but I want you to get it. These young men could afford to be free in these ways because they had the secure membership. Because they had, they knew they were men. So they could be what we would call feminine. We don't know we're men, so many of us can't afford to be those things. That's the way this culture works. And it's really, 
violent. So, <clears throat> so what I focus in my work with is the issue of reconnection. When I work with women in this culture, depressed women, troubled women, then what I stay focused in on uh, is the issue of empowerment, because so women truly are oppressed. When I work with men, a man in trouble is almost always a disconnected man. Hmm? He's disconnected from the people around him, and or he's disconnected from himself. That's our plight, disconnection. So the work that I do is very active work to stop the bad behavior and to teach guys step by step what connection looks like. It's very similar work, I think, or analogous work, to the work that women did 20 years ago with each other around teaching each other how to reclaim the half of their humanity that they've been lost. You know, assertion groups and... And I would like, somehow, in subsequent developments, to extend this expression work and this fullness to um, include our relationship to women. Uh, at some point, I see that as the next step. I think there's a real place for pulling away and having a retreat and getting really grounded with one another. And then sooner or later, I think it has to go back. And uh, I don't know if we're ready for that yet, but I don't know if they're ready for that yet. Yeah. But I'm trying to build those bridges. And, uh, you know, in a funny way, whether the leaders of this or that are ready for it, I think the people are ready for it. I do. I do. Oh, I just, I just, I love the idea about, about, um, you know, the, being worried about turning into a woman, being worried about turning into a girl, and, but one thing that, in talk about identifying with a negative image, you know, that, that we, you know, we're not female, we're not women, but I think the, the other side, I've always, I've always struggled about this masculine and feminine parts of ourselves, mm -hmm. and I've always thought, you know, when I am sweet, I'm not a woman. That's not right. in my right. mind. Right. That's, that's, well, it's not a feminine thing. I am a sweet man. Right. Yeah. So it's not my feminine side. It's that's learning right. how to be sweet. Yes. Just as a woman who knows how and when to be fierce is not being a man or, or showing her masculine side, because her fierceness as a woman is, you know, is, is her fierceness as a woman. Beautiful. And not necessarily her masculine or feminine. That's side. right. Yeah. And you know, if there's anything that's happening here, it's about the celebration of the beauty of men, and uh, and uncovering that. That's exactly right. And I don't. Uh, uh, yeah. So I don't. Um, I myself don't even use those terms about my feminine side or my my masculine side. I just think about full human beings able to be full. And a woman's being full will be in a womanly way because she's a woman. And a man's being full will be in a manly way because it's a man. But I don't take a sort of, I don't draw a line down a piece of paper and say all the qualities on the right side of the line are womanish and all the qualities on the left side of the line are mannish. I find that. That's sort of a, a continuing dualism, <laughs> which is, was, was incredibly powerful in the Victorian era and is still incredibly powerful in cultural uh, rap today. So I really appreciate your, your hmm. making that point. Yeah, it's a good point. And it also sort of kind of, when, when you get to there, I think it kind of eases some of the enmity between the sexes. You're kind of like, OK, everybody can calm, calm down a little bit. A lot of the way, I don't have to worry about motivating you guys, but a lot of times when I'm sitting with a guy in my office who's kind of, he doesn't want to be there, he's being dragged by somebody. Uh, <laughs> the way that I can get him hooked into the work is just simply to say, what kind of father did you have? What kind of father would you like to be? Uh, John Bradshaw had a little saying. Um, what did he say? Uh, something like, um, pass it back or pass it on. If you don't pass it back, you will pass it on. Yeah. So um, the work that we do 
to turn around and deal with the pain and grief instead of inflict it, to learn how to open our hearts and be fuller human beings is work that we're not just doing for ourselves, it's work that we're doing for the generations that follow us. It's a gift. And then the last thing I want to say, which is preaching to the saved on this one, but it's a point I always make, which is it's work that's really too hard to do alone. And the other great thing that's been taken from us is community. When I speak about connection, I speak about connection inside ourselves to our feelings, our wants, our needs, our poetry, our beauty. I speak about connection to others, our children, peers, our lovers. And I speak about community, about the restoration of empathy for each other as a collective. I don't have answers for all that, but I think that's where the healing comes. Good. I got through it. Thank you.